I had always heard tales about the dark web, a concealed corner of the internet where the unthinkable could be bought and sold. However, the thought of exploring it myself never crossed my mind. It seemed too daunting, perilous, and not to mention, illegal. One day, a YouTube video caught my attention, highlighting the bizarre aspects of the dark web. As a naive, rebellious teenager, I impulsively decided to delve into its depths, initially resembling any other website, with links to diverse topics and products. The content grew increasingly disturbing as I clicked through. There were sites peddling drugs, weapons, and even advertisements for human trafficking. The images and videos were gruesome, inducing a sickening feeling in my stomach. Yet, I could not tear my eyes away. While scrolling, I chanced upon a site that offered something intriguing, a mysterious and exclusive club called The Black Room. Initially skeptical, I realized it was authentic. Club members paid a hefty sum for unimaginable experiences. After completing a detailed application, I received an email inviting me to the next event at an undisclosed location with specific instructions. Arriving at a dilapidated warehouse on the outskirts of town, fear enveloped me. The atmosphere was dark and foreboding, and the attendees resembled figures from a horror movie, masked in costume. Guided to a room, I met the host named the Baron, who explained the rules and proceedings. Despite being told I could leave at any time, wearing the mask did not ease my unease. As the night unfolded, the events surpassed any imagination. People endured torture, humiliation, and degradation. It resembled a scene from hell, and the realization of my participation sank in. I had made a grave mistake, putting myself in danger with uncertain consequences. Suddenly, the lights extinguished, and in the darkness, footsteps approached. My heart pounded as I tried to run, but the lack of visibility hindered me. A hand seized me, pulling me towards a door thrown into a small room, and panic gripped me as I realized I was trapped. The wall seemed to close in, and the sound of my breathing echoed in the suffocating silence. Hours passed, and I remained confined, fear and uncertainty racing through my mind. The unknown awaited me and the question of whether I would appear alive loomed ominously. Story 2 I lost my left eye when I was only six years old. It was a stupid way to lose an eye, but luckily most people tend not to ask how I lost it. The majority worry it might be insensitive. It is not a story I like to tell, not because it is upsetting or brings back bad memories. I just feel embarrassed by it. Growing up, my brother and I were obsessed with Robin Hood, the outlaw of Sherwood Forest, who would take from the rich and give to the poor. I am not going to pretend this heroic savior of the poor was our hero because of his good deeds. We simply liked him because of his legendary skill with a bow and arrow. Our father, a keen gardener, had lots of bamboo sticks piled up beside the shed which he would tie plants to, to stop them from drooping when they grew. It was my brother's idea to take one and attach a length of string to both ends to create a bow. I thought he was an absolute genius. When we had finished making the bow, we made an arrow, simply by using a handsaw to carve a small groove into one end of an arrow-sized piece of bamboo, which would function as a nest for the string to sit. I'm first, my brother said. No, I cried. It was my idea, so I get to shoot first. And that was that. At one end of the garden, there was a little wall that surrounded one of my father's flower patches. Upon the wall, we placed an empty plastic bottle to be used as our target. My brother, of course, then took the first turn, missing wildly and falling far short of the bottle on the wall. Next, it was my go, and I it took about an hour before we had both knocked the bottle bizarrely once. Right, now you stand in the middle, and I'll shoot over your head at the target. Another genius idea by my brother. I did not argue. I thought it was a cool thing to do, and if I did it, then my brother would have to let me have a go shooting over him. I do not believe he meant to do it. It was just a careless accident. But the arrow never made it past my body. It struck me hard and deep in my left eye, 
Straight away, blood poured down my cheek and I screamed in agony. I spent a couple of days in hospital before the doctors decided they would have to remove what was left of my eye. Until I was 12, I wore an eye patch, but when I moved to secondary school, I decided to get my first glass eye, try and put an end to the pirate joke. It might sound weird, but I loved my glass eyes and by the time I was 16 and leaving school I had collected dozens, all different colors and designs. My missing eye stopped being something I tried to hide and strangely became my kind of signature. Kids would say, have you seen the boy with a spiral in his eye? Or have you seen the lad with an eye like a cat? I enjoyed this. It allowed me to embrace my injury and make it part of my identity. I continued collecting glass eyes for many years, always on the lookout for new designs or something different from what I already had. When I was 25, I discovered the dark web. A friend from my Dungeons and Dragons club told me about how he had used it to buy some sort of hallucinogenic. I did not plan to use the dark web for anything like that. I was just intrigued by the idea of it. Once I was on, I started looking for stores. It was amazing and disgusting. People selling guns, drugs, services, and even other people. It made me feel a little bit ill knowing I was now a part of this strange illicit world. I went on to one store page which called itself Mr. Bubbles Objects of Trouble was the first store I had come across that had a search bar. So, let us see if they have it. I typed in the words, Glass Eye. I did not expect anything to come up and I was rather surprised when a match popped up on my screen. The item was called The Sight of Sin, which was simply a black eye with a small red number 7 on it. It pulled at my fancy, so I decided to buy it. I did not truly expect it to show up, but one week later a package arrived and there it was. As customary with all my new eyes, I washed the eye in a solution to make sure it was clean. When washed, I put it in a case with the rest of my eyes and went back to watching television. The next morning when I woke up, I thought I would evaluate the new eye to see if it was a good fit and to check how comfortable it was. It went in with ease and felt perfect, so I decided to leave it in for the rest of the day. Nothing strange happened at first. It was just my usual daily routine of having breakfast and doing some work on my laptop. But then the doorbell rang. As I opened the door, I at once knew something was not right. I had double vision suddenly. Only one man was standing on my front doorstep trying to sell me solar panels, but I could see him twice. One image of him was completely ordinary, just the bloke dressed in a suit holding a brochure and telling me about how he could save me money on my electricity bill. But the other image... Well, it was him, but dressed up in a gimp suit cracking a whip against the floor lustfully. I do not think I said a word to him, I just stared transfixed by what I was seeing. Eventually, I closed the door and stood there for a moment trying to understand what had just happened. I passed it off at the time as just my mind playing tricks on me and that I must be overtired. I decided to take a nap. I was woken by a telephone call from my father asking if I was still coming to his house for dinner. I looked at the time and realized I was running late, so I grabbed my coat and flew out the door. On my way to my father's house, which is just a ten minute walk down the road from mine, I walked past just one person, a lady, walking her dog, but again, I saw double. In one image she was completely ordinary. Apart from being overweight, she was wearing a pink coat and beside her, a dog trotted along minding its own business. But, in another part of my vision, I could see her again, completely naked, eating tin dog food with a fork. Jellied meat dripped down onto breasts which she licked ravenously. I was almost sick. I thought about just going home and going back to bed, still trying to convince myself I was simply tired from working but my father missed not having me at home and I did not want to let him down. Though now I wish I did. Now, what happened next will not make much sense unless I explain something. When I was two years old, my mother died. I say died. She was killed whilst walking home from work one night on this very estate. Nobody has ever been caught about her murder, but now I know exactly who took my mother from me. My father opened the door with a large grin on his face. Come in, son. He said cheerily, but I did not move. Besides, 
The image of my father standing in the doorway was another vision of him holding a knife, and lying beneath him on the floor was my mother, soaked in blood, eyes vacant and still. I took a step back from my father and did not stop running until I had reached the front door of my house. Straight away I went onto the dark web and searched for Mr. Bubble's store, but it had gone, vanished, like it had never been there. I did not leave the house for a few days. I did not answer the door. I did not even pick up the phone. What I did was sit by the window looking out onto the street, watching the people walking past. I know what I am seeing now. It makes little sense, but it is the only thing I can think of that almost explains what I am seeing. Firstly, when I remove the glass eye, I no longer see two images of everyone. I only see one just like I always have. But when the eye is in, I see two visions of every person I look at in the flesh. Secondly, I know what I am seeing. I am seeing their sins. I know that sounds utterly mad, but it is the only thing all this seems to point to. The name of the glass eye, the red number seven, and the grotesque and disturbing images I see. It is their sins I am seeing with my new eye. I see the true hideous nature of people, the part of themselves they hide from everyone else. I know I could just take the eye out and forget about it, but I just cannot bring myself to do this. I cannot trust anybody without it. I cannot see the real them. But seeing people's darkest secrets also leaves me alone, for once you see the hidden nature of someone you never want to be close to again. Many questions stayed, but I had the glass eye tested, and it was laced with some hard drugs. Be careful. Story 3 The dark web stays a realm veiled in mystery and peril, harboring the darkest and most nightmarish entities. For one unsuspecting individual, it would evolve into a nightmare beyond imagination. Samantha, a young computer programmer, started the sequence of events when she chanced upon a hidden link during her internet exploration. Driven by curiosity, she clicked, unaware of the impending nightmare she was about to unleash. Her journey into the abyss of the dark web led Samantha to chilling videos depicting unspeakable violence and depravity. The more she delved, the clearer it became that she had ventured too far. Yet, it was too late to retreat. Cryptic messages from an anonymous source started flooding her inbox, taunting and threatening her with unspeakable violence. Despite her attempts to block the sender, the messages persisted, each one more menacing than the last. One fateful night, while lying in bed, Samantha heard an eerie noise emanating from her computer. Approaching cautiously, she found her screen inundated with grotesque images and eerie whispers seeping from the speaker. Terrified, she tried to shut off her computer, only to be met with resistance. Even after unplugging it, the screen continued to glow with horrifying images, and the whispers intensified. Consumed by sheer terror, Samantha fled her apartment but the haunting messages and images trailed her relentlessly. Seeking help from authorities proved futile as they found no evidence of the messages or the sender. Days turned into weeks, and Samantha's mental state crumbled. She became a mere shell, living in perpetual fear and paranoia, unable to break free from the malevolent influence of the dark web. To this day, the fate of Samantha remains unknown. Some believe she vanished without a trace while others guessed that she succumbed to the dark web's horrors by taking her own life. One certainty persists. The scariest story about the dark web is the one that never truly concludes. Story 4 Judith, an individual who relished the tranquility of her secluded cabin in the woods, received an unexpected message on the dark web inviting her into a clandestine group of kindred spirit, claiming dedication to exploring human experience's limits and challenging conventional morality. The group intrigued Judith, leading her to reluctantly join. Initially, everything appeared normal. The members shared her affinity for the unconventional, fostering a sense of camaraderie. However, as weeks passed, Judith noticed unsettling activities verging on dangerous and illegal prompting doubts about her decision to join. Attempting to withdraw proved futile. The group had ensnared her, 
subjecting her to increasingly bizarre and perilous rituals. Trapped in a web of fear and darkness, Judith endured months of a living nightmare, compelled to act against her belief. Refusing to succumb, Judith patiently awaited an escape opportunity. Finally seizing her chance, she slipped away from the group, returning to her cabin in the woods. Yet, horrors persisted. Threatening messages warned her of the group's intent to retrieve her. Despite trying to ignore them, Judith felt a constant, ominous presence. Strange figures lurked in the shadows, and eerie noises plagued her night. One evening, a knock at her door revealed a hooded figure with a knife. A silent confrontation ensued, and Judith found herself tied to a chair, facing the group's leader. Taunting her with the prospect of a life in perpetual fear, he looked to fulfill their dark agenda. Undeterred, Judith fought fiercely, overpowering her assailant. Escaping into the woods, she left the dark web and the group behind, choosing a life of solitude on her terms, determined never to let fear control her again. Story 5 The sky hung heavy with ominous gray clouds, enveloping the land in a somber shadow on a dark and gloomy day. Even the birds sought refuge from the impending storm as people hurriedly scurried past each other, seeking shelter. In the heart of this desolate city, a hidden realm known as the Dark Web thrived as an ethereal space where secrets whispered and darkness thrived. It remained inaccessible to most, known only to those daring enough to venture into its depths. From the shadows of the Dark Web appeared a figure named B, an expert hacker with a reputation echoing through the digital underworld. Unique in his pursuit, B looked for not only personal agendas, but also to expose the darkness within the Dark Web. On this ominous day, he found himself imprisoned in his basement, rain pelting against the window, seemingly mocking him, stumbling upon a significant revelation. A secret organization within the dark web sent shivers down his spine. This organization wielded incomprehensible power, rumored to be involved in illegal activities from human trafficking to cyber attacks. Determined to unveil the truth, B navigated the treacherous labyrinth of the dark web, meeting encrypted code, firewalls, and a mysterious figure named Samira. Together, they unraveled the web of secrets, discovering shocking truths and treading on thin ice. Their investigation intensified, revealing darker secrets and making their quest more perilous. As they closed in on the elusive truth, the organization sensed their every move. A battle of wits ensued with B's hacking skills and Samira's cunning against the organization's vast resources. On the eve of a storm, they cracked the last line of defense, exposing the hidden truths that shook society to its core. Members of the organization faced justice, and victims found solace. As the rain subsided, the city began to heal, bathed in newfound light. B.B. and Samira vanished into the shadows, their mission accomplished. The dark web, Scared by their exposure, was forever marked by the battle fought on that dark and gloomy day. As the sun broke through the clouds, casting warm rays upon the city, a glimmer of hope appeared from the remnants of darkness. The world became a little safer, knowing that heroes lurked even in the darkest corners, ready to shine a light on the darkest secrets. Story 6 I sat down at my computer and opened the Tor browser. I had been reading recently about using the dark web. I did not want to do any of that crazy stuff. Nothing weird. No dead bodies or torture or weird porn or anything. I was just curious. For me, the dark web was like driving past a car crash. You do not want to see what happened. All the gory details and bodies. But at the same time, you have to look. You have to see. You have to know and witness, and you want to see the viscera. You need it, and you hate that you need it. I was able to find some basic dark websites. I kept messing them up, typing .com instead of .onion, but I was slowly making progress. One site would lead me to another, and I wound up on a site that paired you with anonymous chat partners. I was running under the username Stevie. Yes, whine about it, but the 69 made it funny. 
In a chat room, Stevie, a curious but inexperienced user, encounters gatekeeper of secrets on the dark web. Eager to prove himself, Stevie engages in a conversation and learns about a realm of secret. To gain access, the gatekeeper asks for a meaningful secret in return. Stevie, initially reluctant, shares a harmless secret about watching his neighbor undress. Gatekeeper provides a link and password guiding Stevie to a new chat room with Guardian of Secrets. Stevie is then redirected to a chat with Secrets, who claims to know Joey's dark secret. Intrigued, Stevie agrees to learn the secret, only to discover that his sister is having an affair with Joey in his bed. Shocked and disgusted, Stevie is coerced into supplying another secret about someone else to prevent the exposure of his secret. Panicking, Stevie thinks of Dan and offers a secret about Dan's relationship with an attractive girlfriend named Mel. The situation intensifies as Secrets demands powerful secrets within a tight time frame. Turns out Mel was having some fun on the side with a girl named Mallory. She was super sneaky about it. The only reason Dan found out was because he had installed a hidden camera in Mel's bathroom so he could creep on her, and he saw them getting it on in the shower together. So... Dan made copies of the tape and sold it all over campus, posted it online behind a paywall, made a few hundred bucks Mel and Mallory were traumatized, obviously, and they both ended up dropping out of school. I have not heard from them since. No one else knew how the video was made, and when Mel tried to say something about it, the school called her disgrace and refused to listen. I heard she moved to another state. Interesting. Secrets replied, I accept this as payment. Would you like a second secret? I am willing to supply up to three, so long as the payment is acceptable in return. I was in way too deep. I should stop. This was serious. But I thought of another secret I could tell. About my sister and the white powder I had seen peeking out of her makeup bag. And if I had payment at the ready, then this should not be a problem. What do you get? I asked secret. You know Sasha, the girl you stare at an intro to Kemp. How did he know about that? Yeah, I typed. She took these, but never sent them out. Below the last chat bubble, a zip folder appeared. Downloaded. Secret said. Once the secret is started, it must be completed. Otherwise, there will be consequences. Death by angry husband, he did not need to add. I downloaded the folder and extracted the files. It was a dozen image files. I clicked on the first one to open it. It was Sasha, smiling at the camera, wearing a low-cut yellow dress. It was attractive, but not as scandalous as I had feared. Hoped. I went to the second Sasha was removing the dress. In the third, no more dress. By the sixth picture, she was completely naked, and by the twelfth, I had seen all of her, inside and out. She was stunning and I had my little file of photos of her for the next time I was feeling lonely and too afraid to text. I saw a new message pop up behind the photos, and I switched back to the chat. Payment for these photos will be photos of your own. Take photos of yourself without clothes in the same positions as Sasha. You need to use props the same way as her, as well. Your sister should have toys you can borrow. Whoa now, I typed. That is too far. I have a secret that I can pay with instead. Take the photos or face the consequences. Secrets responded. Wait, look, it's a really good secret, I typed. Last chance secrets typed. You'll enjoy it, I imagine. The secrets about drugs and everything. I typed. Prepare for a visitor, secrets said. Then my screen went black and the computer turned itself off. I heard my neighbor's door slam and heavy footsteps run through our yard. Open the door, Stevie. I know you are home, and I am going to rip your face off. I heard my mom's friend's husband yell as he yanked open the front door. Story 7 I tend to become fixated on something new for a short period before moving on to the next fixation. The dark web is something I have never been able to shake. It has always piqued my curiosity. I am not sure if it is the secrecy surrounding it or the allure of obtaining things I should not have, but after a recent experience, it is something I wish I never got so obsessed with. One night, a friend, let us call them H, 
and I had an evening without our significant others, using the time for a long overdue catch-up over some beers. Everything was going well, and it had been a while since we had such a night. Somehow, the topic of my mentioned obsession, the dark web, with a fair amount of alcohol in our systems, I decided to lift the lid of my laptop and load up the Tor browser for some drunk exploration. I had only briefly explored the dark web once before, and perhaps that is where my obsession stems from. After about 30 minutes of searching, we found a link that piqued our interest more than any other. Make a miserable life. It is slightly disturbing that we did not hesitate to visit this site. A simple interface popped up with the title at the top, a logo at the bottom, and multiple text boxes in between all fields for someone's data. On the right was a short description of their services. Want revenge? Want to see someone at their lowest? Everything they have ruined beyond belief? That's what we're here for. Little did I know the consequences of that thought. Due to courage from a bottle, I thought it would be a funny idea to evaluate this service on myself. I filled out my details and transferred the Bitcoin for payment, finding it cheaper than expected. Now, all I had to do was wait. The next day, I woke up to my phone ringing. Slightly hung over and half asleep, I answered slowly. Hello. It was rare for my boss to call, especially at 8 a.m. on the weekend. I'm sorry for this, but your actions from last night have led me to have to release you from your position. You need help. The call ended, leaving me confused and frustrated. I messaged H to see what happened, but the message did not go through, and tries to call went straight to voicemail. Strange. Turning on the TV and making myself a coffee for energy, I saw a headline, A male in his twenties is wanted by the CIA. Videos have emerged of him torturing another male named H, as well as multiple children. Shocked, I approached the TV, and it switched to a picture of the male. Me. A loud knock at the door diverted my attention from the news. Peeking through the curtains, I saw hundreds of people, including who I thought were friends and family, holding posters wishing me dead, some armed with bricks. Not knowing what to do, I ran upstairs, petrified. Opening my phone, I found emails with videos from the news clearly showing me torturing my best friend and several unknown children. An email arrived, saying, Thank you for using our service. The misery has been delivered. We hope you're satisfied with the result. I have not left my house yet, and I know that if I did, I would not be given a chance to return. That is the last time I ever indulge in my favorite obsession. Story 8 In the shadowy recesses of my mind, I have often pondered the macabre notion of silently severing someone's throat from behind. Picture this. Extracting a razor-sharp icicle from the depths of your boot and ruthlessly plunging it into its pulsate. Yes, I have entertained such thoughts. And yes, I have acted upon them. My journey into darkness began at the tender age of five. Despite having emotions, I had mastered the art of concealing them within the recesses of a mental abyss I dubbed the Void. This mental compartmentalization eased my actions as I sat in the sandbox, a construct my oblivious parents had erected in our backyard. A rabbit, oblivious to its imminent fate, ambled along the edges of wooden pillars. Swift as a child, I ambushed the unsuspecting creature, seizing its ears. Confusion clouded my young mind. I a mere five-year-old, had gained a semblance of consciousness. It was as if the universe, sensing a potential misstep, tried to avert a heedless mistake. Yet, I persisted. Clutching the bunny's ears, I flung it relentlessly against the coarse grains of sand. Whimpers echoed as the creature's fur succumbed to repeated impacts, its lifeblood staining the sand a dark, almost black hue. At that moment, my parents... Seeing my gruesome act from the kitchen window, intervened. Despite their efforts, the rabbit lay lifeless, and I faced the repercussions of my actions that day. Fast forward to my eleventh year, my mother's cancer diagnosis engulfed our lives. Dad withdrew me from school, and we stood vigil by her hospital bedside until her lifeless form lay on the sterile bed. While Dad wept, her death left me oddly indifferent. Death entreated me 
and I delved into researching the afterlife during my teenage years. Questions about legacy and remembrance consumed me. Would anyone remember me? Would my demise matter? Who would mourn my departure? Deep contemplation yielded an unsettling answer. At the age of 18, I resolved to craft a legacy as the world's foremost female serial killer. The prospect of ending a human life intrigued me. They were no different from animals. Right, I had already extinguished the life of a rabbit. However, the challenge lies in the method. Having never murdered anything beyond a rabbit, the prospect of leaving no trace daunted me. Turning to the internet, I scoured forums for guidance, only to meet limited advice. Until a suggestion led me to the dark web. With newfound knowledge of the dark web, I honed my skills and discovered a like-minded individual named Jeremy. His vivid account of a murder, devoid of any trace, captivated me. We devised a plan, and an unconventional choice surfaced. Crafting a weapon from an icicle proved more intricate than expected. Undeterred, I pursued the ideal victim, a man named Mike Hammett. His unremarkable existence made him the perfect target. Stalking him meticulously, I saw his routine and prepared for the impending act. A homemade icicle weapon, weighted shoes, a disposable disguise, and meticulous planning to erase any evidence. Texting Jeremy, I shared my plan, receiving his enthusiastic approval. In that exchange, a strange sense of affection blossomed, a sentiment that lingered. Arriving at Mike's residence, my internal turmoil peaked. The moment of doubt vanished as an emptiness engulfed me once more. Raising my arm, I attacked. The struggle, the screams, and the inevitable demise mirrored the rabbit's fate. In the aftermath, examining Mike's phone revealed a facade of normalcy with texts from acquaintances oblivious to his demise. My meticulous cleanup followed, leaving behind no trace but a lifeless body, a phone, and a pool of water. News broadcasts painted a false narrative of community mourning, devoid of leads. Free from consequences, the risk fueled my anticipation for the next act. Story 9 In the somber town lives a curious 17-year-old named W, teetering on the edge of adulthood. A frequent internet user, she navigates the virtual realm with morbid curiosity, boasting a lost media wiki account and a penchant for delving into the unreleased music of artists. W, in her admission, questions her moral standing, indifferent to the label of goodness. Setting aside the debate on her morality, W feels compelled to share a disturbing revelation. Her internet excursions lead her into the disconcerting realm of Elsa Gate, where she sees the twisted creations concocted by deviants. Recently, her morbid curiosity extended to the dark web, an exploration devoid of illicit activities, merely an act of accessing the forbidden with a sense of accomplishment. Amid her usual exploration, W stumbles upon videos that initially resemble Elsa's gay content. Thumbnails adorned with clip art and exaggerated expressions feature a young woman and a girl, the latter dressed as Elsa. Strangely, the woman bears a familiar face Eve Jackson, a local eccentric known for her TikTok and Instagram presence, is immersed in the world of Kid Core. Perplexed by Eve's presence, W clicks on the video, plunging into a disorienting, vividly colored room. Building blocks and teddy bears litter the floor, while the walls and ceiling assault the senses with vibrant hues. The Eve-like figure addresses the camera, lamenting the departure of her latest friend due to aging, leading to the inevitable usual. A TV flickers to life, playing Frozen, and the girl in the Elsa outfit is ushered in. A surge of terror washes over her as possibly Eve reveals a colorful knife and ruthlessly slits Elsa's throat, the ghastly act captured on camera. Stunned, W grapples with the realization that this transcends Elsa's gate. It is a chilling snuff film. The woman, her hope waning that it is not Eve, cheerfully announces the need for a new victim, concluding the video. Compelled by an inexplicable force, W succumbs to watching the remaining seven videos, each featuring individuals her age dressed as Disney characters, 
with their respective movies playing during the macabre act. Haunted by nightmares, W encounters Eve on the street the following day. A cheerful wave is met with W's terrified scream and a hasty retreat. The unsettling question lingers. Could Eve be the perpetrator behind those heinous videos? Story 10 I penetrated the dark web. I learned to code at the age of 14, and now at 21, I have been doing this for a long time. By day, I work in coding for a pharmaceutical conglomerate. During my off hours, I challenge myself by breaking into unbreakable websites just to prove I can't. A sleuth without the official job title. A cyber sleuth. However, on this day, I went further, not into the deep web, which anyone with basic computer skills could access, but into the dark web, where 5% of the internet is filled with drugs, credit card thieves, arms dealers, and sex traffickers. Using a Tor browser for anonymity and disabling JavaScript to avoid ads, I delved into this. The first sites I explored were unremarkable, one even selling loafers stuffed with taxidermized small birds. Perplexed, I continued, meeting discarded-looking websites. I began to think of the dark web as a virtual garbage dump, but I pressed on. Deeper into the abyss, I found a site featuring a large gold coin with a spinning graphic. Beneath it, a phrase, what is the answer to 99 out of 100 questions? Money. Recognizing it as a credit card fraud, I moved on. The next site displayed a full-screen video of a bedroom. Watching for 20 minutes, I saw an old woman changing clothes. Moving on, I became aware that despite the dark web's anonymity, the federal government could trace information to servers on fake pages designed to catch lawbreakers. Ignoring drug-pushing sites, I met a disturbing scene. A pig pen with a frightened golden retriever on one end and an aggressive mountain lion pulled by two men on the other. With cackling men appalled by animal cruelty, the dark web was not for me. The unsettling feeling grew as I stumbled upon a site with archaic graphics featuring a rainbow above text that read pedophiles are people too. Disturbed, I feared legal consequences. The descent continued with self-mutilation, suicide for pay, arsonists voyeurism, and disturbing fetishes. Eventually, I reached a unique site. The page, a dark blue with an elegant golden border, displayed a message in gold cursive resembling a January 19, 2024 to Century book cover. Trapped in this space, my attempts to navigate back failed. After minutes of silence, the novella black title page flickered, revealing a black and white image of a woman with her mouth open and pupils rolled up. Alarmed, I realized I was still on the site. Before my eyes, the golden cursive text faded into words I could not. I googled the letters, revealing God bless you in ancient Aramaic. The screen turned black with a giant keyhole, and my scroll arrow transformed into a key. Nervous but intrigued, I clicked through confirmation prompts, revealing a Star of David symbol. A Middle Eastern voice speaking an indecipherable language with heavy static played. The recording continued, and my scroll arrow disappeared. Curiosity drove me to record the audio on my phone, later transferring it to my work laptop. As I slept, I awoke to discover a six-and-a-half-hour recording. Upon waking, the website transformed into Automatics Incorporated, a Michigan-based sheet glass manufacturer. Confused but determined, I contacted my college's linguistics department for help in translating the mysterious content. Janice Cruz, the assistant head, responded. In our conversation, Janice revealed the content included astronomy, anti-Semitic propaganda, incantations in 6th century before Christ Aramaic, and planned attacks with precise coordinates in Israel. Panic set in as I realized the dark web had led me to uncover a terrorist plot targeting the Baron Hirsch Synagogue in Memphis, Tennessee, on April 12th. I was released without charges after collaborating with the FBI. I now live in fear, haunted by the nightmares of the tragedy that unfolded. 351 lives lost. The dark web, a place I will never venture again. Story 11 
Story 11 An online film student named Jacob gave a video that left me so horrified that, at 1 a.m., I had to call the dean. She recommended that I turn the clip over to the police. I teach filmmaking at an art college in Maryland, and during the lockdown in late 2020, my filmmaking course shifted online. My usual first assignment as students film a setting. With an online class, students filmed around their houses. Most were eager to showcase their gaming setups and action figure collections. However, Jacob, an unsettling exception, placed his camera on a tripod and filmed a dead oak tree in his backyard for about five minutes. For continuity editing, I usually have students film a chase sequence or a snowball fight. However, with the online format, students opted for cooking or playing with Pets Jacob. However, gave a video of himself tying a noose and hanging a mannequin on the same. I started to feel uneasy, but I had to keep a brave face. Horror and film students often go hand in hand, and I didn't want to appear easily spooked. In the next assignment, Jacob gave a clip of a man wearing a medieval jester costume and a smiling mask, dancing around the dead oak tree. The black and white footage was beyond disturbing. While I was used to receiving horror movies from students, this clip was simply eerie. After class, Jacob messaged me privately, asking if I was tired of seeing the same tree repeatedly. Against my preference, I said no. If he found inspiration in it, then he should stick with it. It felt like the right thing to say at the time. I later learned from other professors that Jacob began incorporating the dead oak tree into all his work. In photography class, he retouched a photo of a car crash onto an image of a dead oak tree. In digital illustration class, he drew a dead oak tree with people hanging from it. Meanwhile, an aspiring YouTuber named Matt asked if he could give a let's play for an assignment. Normally, I would decline, but due to home isolation, I agreed with the condition of adding a lot of narration. During a live Twitch stream of Matt playing PUBG, I was amused to discover that Jacob was one of his team members. After the stream, I asked Matt how he knew Jacob. Matt revealed that Jacob was his neighbor just a few houses down the road. Matt then shared a disturbing incident from their middle school days when a man claiming to have lived in Jacob's house asked for a treehouse. Tragically, the man fell and broke his neck just as Jacob's father was finishing it. Two decades later, the man returned to see the oak tree and Jacob found him hanging from it. In early, Jacob wasn't enrolled in any of my classes, but a cinematography professor video called me about one of Jacob's videos. The assignment was to light up a night scene, but Jacob gave a handheld POV shot circling a tree with a flashlight. She scolded Jacob for not being more professional, and he dropped out of all. Other students also noticed Jacob's obsession with the dead oak tree and started talking to me about it. They revealed that Jacob dropped out of all classes. A few days later, at about p.m., Matt was live streaming on Twitch, and I was watching when Jacob burst through Matt's bedroom door, covered in cuts and bruises, shards of glass all over his body, and his shirt soaked in blood Jacob shocked everyone. Matt, rightfully freaking out, asked Jacob what was wrong. Jacob looked into the camera and asked if I was watching, telling me to check the video he gave. With about 20 people in the chat, including some of my students, I urgently asked a dependable student to call 911 and told Matt to render basic first aid for Jacob. Just as I was about to call the police myself, I received a notification that someone had uploaded a large video file to our department's file storage. Opening it, I found a video clip uploaded by Jacob's username. It showed Jacob placing a camera on the back seat of his car, turning from his driver's seat and staring into the camera. My mouth dropped open as I watched Jacob, without turning back around, step on the gas and crash into the dead oak tree. During the police investigations, it was uncovered that he was heavily involved in a dark web forum and was live streaming for the sinister enjoyment of other. Story 12 We used to play everything together, whether it be Minecraft, Black Ops, or Halo. We always had a blast. We met in middle school, and we were both considered the misfits of our grade. We easily got along, and we bonded over video games heavily. 
Soon, we added each other on Xbox, and the rest was history. A few years went by, and it was 2013. That summer, I got the call. He passed away. I stopped playing video games after that for a while. It reminded me too much of him. The reason I am telling you all this is because a week ago I got an Xbox One. I got it for my 25th birthday, and I was excited. For two days, everything was great, and then something happened that would haunt me forever. My best friend Ian was online. Now he had two brothers, so at first, I thought it was one of them. But it looked exactly like Ian's account. Nothing was changed. I kept in touch with one of his brothers, so I texted him. He was very confused. He then went ahead to tell me no one had access to Ian's account. After that, I got a bit angry, so I messaged the account. Me. How did you get access to this account? Me. I hope it was worth it. Hacking into this account. I just report. I got a response before I could send the message. I decided after that to record everything in a text document, and it would be easier to just show you what I wrote at that time. Day one. What the heck? What the actual heck? How did they know my name? My name is not public on Xbox, and they knew about my dad's passing. I texted Ian's brother to let him know what I just experienced, and he was a bit disturbed as well. He said he was going to try to find the account information and cut it. Ian's account went offline, and I will record anything here if I hear anything. Day 2. Ian's brother Casey texted me this morning. He told me he was unable to find the account information. I kept on getting messages all day from Ian's account. Call me crazy, but I was starting to believe somehow. Some way, it was him. He knew things, things only I and he would know. Day 3. He joined my Minecraft game. It was a single player game. How is that even remotely possible? He would just follow me around and stare. He was always there. It creeped me out. I eventually switched my game to Black Ops and was playing zombies. He joined again, and it was the same. He kept on staring, and then he was gone. Day 4. I'm starting to believe it is not Ian. Something is posing as him. I got another message. He told me I should come with him. He then invited me to a party chat. When I joined, a loud, high-pitched ringing started playing, and I threw my headphones across the room. Then... A voice started speaking through. It sounded like Ian, but something was off. I got freaked out again and turned off my Xbox. I got a text from an unknown number, and it said he just wants me to come with him. Day 5. I removed him as a friend. It wasn't Ian. I had to remind myself that. Somehow, it didn't stop. I am still getting party invites and messages. It's getting aggressive. I am thinking about selling my Xbox. I can't handle it. Day 6. I don't feel safe. Something is watching me. It knows I know it's not Ian. Last night, after I got off my Xbox, I found a note on my bedroom door. It said, it will take me with it. My blood ran cold, and I almost passed out. Today, I sold my Xbox. I decided it was too much to deal with. 